If you're curious why I personally switched to this streamer, but I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, keep watching. Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Now, what we are having here today is the latest digital streamer called SD9, made by SMSL. Now, this one is a little bit tricky and to be perfectly honest, I postponed making this review for as long as I possibly could because it's not an easy one. Personally, I like it very much and I actually kept using it as my main digital streamer in my own system, but it has some quirks that you have to be aware of. And I'll try to present both its great qualities that it does have and its quirks that it also has. And I hope that'll help you make an informed decision about is this a perfect streamer for you or is it a no-go? So let's start with the price first. It's 399, basically 400 US dollars. It's in the hi-fi world, that's not exactly cheap and affordable, but it's not particularly expensive either. I would call it just somewhere in the middle. And I feel it's aimed at those audiophiles that already have some sort of entry-level streamers, but they feel that they want to explore. They, they want to invest a little bit more and probably get a little bit better Sonics. But before we talk about its sound quality, I'll first uh, give you a tour of its features and connectivity. There's a lot to talk about here. So let's start with the connectivity. If you look at the back of the unit, you'll see the connectivity is really rich. And let's start with inputs first. You can connect this streamer to your home network using Ethernet port. You can also use Wi-Fi antenna to do it wirelessly. And you have two USB inputs. And with these USB inputs, yes, you can definitely connect some sort of USB flash uh, with music stored on it in folders, etc. Oh, there is also a micro SD card input. I forgot to mention that. You can just take a big SD card, load it with your favorite files, favorite music, put it inside of this unit and play directly from it. But for me personally, the most interesting connection is actually uh, Ethernet port and Wi-Fi because that's a network connection, meaning that, for example, you can connect any sort of NAS in your home to this unit. Also, that means you can stream from a lot of uh, Internet streaming services such as Tidal, Koboos and so on. And they'll get to these different features just a little bit later after we finish talking about connectivity. And now it's actually time to uh, mention what sort of digital outputs you have available. And to put it simply, you basically have all sort of outputs that you can imagine or ever want. Starting with USB, so if you connect your USB DAC to one of these USB ports, this unit will detect it and use that USB port as the output to send the signal to the external DAC. We also have optical output on board, then we have coaxial output, I squared S in a form of HDMI port, and also AES EBU, which is in a form of XLR connector. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of combinations here. Different inputs, different outputs. They all sound a little bit different from each other. And it's so hard to assess these things because I know a lot of you in comments will ask me which output sounds the best to you or something like that. But these things are so difficult to objectively assess. Why? Because different DACs also have USB inputs and coaxial inputs and optical inputs that are not always equally good. Sometimes USB one is better or coaxial one is better. Also cables, even if you don't believe in that, quality of digital cables do influence the sound quality to some degree 
And if you try to compare USB output to coaxial output, your results may vary depending on your DAC and on your USB cable, your coaxial cable. Same goes for every other connection. It's something that I simply cannot reliably test and tell you, oh, use this output, it's the best one. What I can tell you is that all of them sound really, really good. Just use the one that is the most suitable for your needs. If you have a USB DAC only, okay, no dilemma. If you have a choice, try finding out which one of those inputs on your DAC is solved best technically. Or if you already invested in a decent USB cable, use that one. If you already invested in a decent coaxial cable, you use that one. If your DAC does have I squared S connection, try using that one. In most cases, it should provide better fidelity than either optical USB or coaxial. And you can control this unit either by using this volume knob slash button because it's clickable or uh, with a provided remote control. Now I'll quickly power it on. It only needs few seconds before it's up and fully ready for use. That's actually quite nice. And as you can see, there is like a small LCD display in the front of the unit. And with that said, let me lead you through some features of this streamer. Okay, so this is the main menu, the one you see when you power on the unit. And from here, you can select several different submenus. Now playing is the first one, but we are not playing anything at the moment. There's my music, which is actually your library. Uh, you can see recently played songs there. It says unknown because most of the times I'm actually using DLNA and UPnP connection, and it, it doesn't remember those songs that are streamed. Only if you play something locally, it'll show the name of the song in the recent play. My favorites, albums, playlists, so on. This one is uh, one of the most important, it's Explorer. So for example, if I want to play something located on an SD card or I have something stored on a USB flash at the moment, I would enter here, I can see all of my folders, albums, and so on. And let's just play something so you can see, okay, this one. Okay, now we automatically entered the now playing menu. And basically here you can see some basic information about the file, sample rate, and also nice touch, album cover. I like that. But realistically, it's important only if you are using it in a desktop kind of environment, because if you sit like uh, two meters back in the couch, all of this becomes very unreadable on the display. And uh, also important to mention that in case if you're using UPnP and streaming from Tidal or Kobuz, for example, the album cover will not be showed. It will just be a blank. Unfortunately, because that's my main mode of use for any streamer, basically. And next, you have some play settings that you can tinker with. I will not go through all of them. It's pretty mainstream and self-explanatory, basically. The next one is system settings. Now, this one is interesting because there's quite a bit of settings that you can tinker with here. And some of them actually alters the sound, the, the tonality of this streamer. So, for example, okay, EQ and MSEB. These two are very interesting. In EQ, you can see some presets like pop, rock, etc. You can also do some custom alterations, but first you have to turn it on. So if I'm not wrong here, we have 10 band equalizer, so you can alter the frequency response to your taste. But even more interesting than this, in my opinion, is the next option called MSEB. Now here, you can do a lot of interesting things, like choosing overall temperature of the sound, bass extension, bass texture, and so on and so on. There are a lot of interesting things that you can play with here. 
and it works. It actually alters the sound. And this might be a saver if you have some problem in the rest of your system. And I have to say, this is really fun to play with. A limitation is that uh, I believe you can use this setting only up to 96 kilohertz files. If you are using files that are higher in sample rate, for example 192, MSCB will not work. So it has a limitation. That's probably due to the processing power of the streamer. It probably cannot handle sample rates higher than 96 kilohertz because it does not have enough of computing power to do a DSP alteration successfully on those high, really, really high resolution files. That said, if you decide to tinker with either EQ or MSCB, know that absolute sound fidelity will take a hit. This means that the tiniest details when it comes to transients and edges and just the tone decay and things like that will be obscured a little bit. So personally, I played with this for fun a little bit and of course for the purpose of this review, but eventually I turned off the EQ and MSCB because that way I achieved the best possible sound fidelity. And in my opinion, this streamer sounds neutral and natural, so it doesn't really need these to make it sound good. Next interesting option is to adjust the brightness of your screen and for the most of this review I actually kept it on the lowest. In the rest of the review display might seem quite dim. I only wish that there is an option to turn off the display completely. There is even a system update uh, option here. But so far, there are no system updates available on the official website. I hope they will be at some moment, because this unit has quite a bit of quirks. And unfortunately, this is the part that I have to cover. So what's happening? For example, if I play something over UPnP, using mConnect app, often resulted in unexpected freezes or connection loss. Streamer and the app, they lose connection between each other. So you have to restart the streamer and the app and start all over again. Another thing that annoyed me quite a bit is, for example, if I'm playing a piece of music and they want to alter some sort of setting. That especially goes for UPnP and DLNA connection. I have to get back, but it asks me, do you want to leave the LNA connection? And you have to say yes. Then the reproduction of the music stops. You go to the settings, you alter the thing you wanted to alter. Then you have to reconnect with the streamer again and play the music again. If you wish to alter some settings, you again have to completely drop the connection and drop the music playing and do the process all over again. I'm not sure why is this happening. Is it some sort of hardware limitation or just operating system that is rough around the edges? But it can be annoying especially until you are still playing with these settings, trying different options, EQs, and so on. But actually, once this initial phase is over, I didn't encounter that much problems. I just kept the unit powered on and connected to my home network. Same with my phone. And then everything works just as expected. It would work without a hitch several days. But every now and then I do encounter some sort of small glitch or a freeze or connection loss and I have to restart the unit every once in a while. That never happened to me with other streamers. Uh, anything based on Raspberry Pi, for example. That could work for months without you ever have to think about it. I hope they can fix it with a firmware update, but we'll have to wait and see. I'll, I'll keep you posted if something happens on that front. All that said and done, 
the important question, for me at least, probably the most important question, is how does it sound? And in short, it sounds really, really good, especially when you consider its price. Now, I'll just quickly tell you that tonally, it's quite neutral, it's highly detailed and resolving. Starting with the bass line, it's firm, it's tidy, it's well controlled. Mid bass also, so you do uh, hear a lot of textures, a lot of information coming from the bass. And the same is true for the mid range and the highest spectrum also. It's highly revealing, with a lot of details, with a lot of texture, clean, crisp edges and transients, not much warmth, to be perfectly honest, but I definitely feel it's voiced neutral. It's not overly thin or bright or analytical either. And as I mentioned when we were talking about the features, you can alter the tonality to a darker one, warmer one, you can tame high frequencies, emphasize whatever you want using this uh, integrated EQ options, but I personally don't like to do that because every time you enable this sort of DSP processing, the sound fidelity takes a hit. It's not huge, maybe in an entry-level system it wouldn't be noticeable, for example if you're like rocking, uh, I don't know, 200 US dollars speakers and like two or 300 US dollars amp, you maybe wouldn't notice the decrease in sound fin fidelity when you engage EQ settings. But in a better, higher-end system, you definitely notice that resolution and transient clarity takes a hit when you engage any EQ preset. So I'll just keep talking about how it sounds when none of the EQ, none of the DSP is applied. It sounds really revealing, quite neutral tonally. It has firm grip on bass line, on edges, on transients. Dynamics is really nice, and because highest spectrum is very open and very detailed, it can develop a really wide and spacious soundstage with great layering, really great positioning of the instruments. Now, to put all of that into a perspective, I'll try to make a few comparisons, as usual. And the first one is my own Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with Allo DG1 board. Now, this is a basic DG1 board, not the signature one. And to put it simply, SD9 sounds better. It can uncover more details. It's quicker sounding, baseline is a little bit grippier, a little bit firmer, better controlled. Highest frequencies are more open, more airy, and because of that, soundstage feels wider. The atmosphere that you can hear from some recordings, that sense of air, that, that slight noise from the microphones, echoes from the walls, or some, if there are such effects in the recording, all of that is heard better through SD9 than through DG1. And because of that, you definitely feel that the sound stage is going wider around your speakers. It's also taller. Yeah, you definitely feel like there's more air and, and things extend higher physically. And in comparison, Allo DG1 sounded warmer a uh, more closed up top, also a little bit smoother, but definitely less resolving. Going back to DG1 actually felt like someone is just dimming the light. Sometimes it's pleasant, but I definitely can see less into the, into the music and into the recording. And that was for me a, a quite big win, because, important thing to say, I was comparing them by powering this one, Allo DG1, with Allo Shanti power supply, linear power supply. And up until now, I could consider that to be a pretty good streamer for the money. This will amount to like 150, 160, and then adding Shanti linear power supply 
would increase that price to like 3, 350, 400, depending on your region and import taxes, things like that. So price of this one with linear power supply is quite comparable to SD9. And SD9 definitely sounds better. And in my book, that's a mighty accomplishment because Allo Digi One sounds great to begin with. SD9 actually reminds me more on the sound that I've heard with uh, Digi One Signature. Now, I did not compare them directly because I didn't have that one at the same time as SD9, but I remember that similar sensation, like more air, more open sound, more details. So, as I mentioned, I cannot fully compare this one with Digi1 Signature, but I feel that it's much closer to it, much more comparable to Digi1 Signature than it is to Digi1 Plain version. And another streamer that I've just recently tested is Lindemann Lime Tree Bridge. It's around 700 or 750 US dollars streamer. It is also powered with 5 volts DC, the same as Raspberry Pi and Digi1. I also used that one with external linear power supply, which I don't need for SD9 because it goes directly to 220 or 110, depending on the region, of course. But I do remember Lime Tree Bridge sounding even more detailed and even more open than SD9. But in that case, we are talking about Lime Tree Bridge, which is 7 something, and then Linear Power Supply, which prices vary of these power supplies, but let's say that you're using something similar as I do, like uh, Alashanti, that amounts to almost like $1,000 or euros. It's quite a bit more expensive than SD9 here. It does sound a little bit more resolving in my opinion, but not by much. And that's always the case in hi-fi. You always pay a little bit of upgrade significantly more. That's perfectly understandable, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of where SD9 comes in. And in my opinion, it comes in somewhere around Allo DG1 signature and quite close not right there, but quite close to Lindemann Lime Tree Bridge at the price that's actually at the level of Allo Digi One plus linear power supply. And in my book, that makes it a pretty good deal. And this is also a good time to make my conclusion about it. So when you actually count in what you do get, and you get a fully functional streamer with LCD display, with a remote control that's powered directly from the socket. And like that, it sounds really good. I think this is a really, really good bang for the buck. And I liked it. As I mentioned, I kept using it in my own system because I mainly use it as a bridge. That means uh, I use its UPnP connectivity. Sometimes it freezes or it loses connections. It happens once in a while. Like, I don't know, it depends. Sometimes like once a day, sometimes once every few days. For me, it's not a huge problem because all you have to do is just quickly turn it off, turn it on, it's maybe 10 seconds, and your third-party app, like Bubble UPnP, will discover it again quickly on the network. That works fine with me, but I completely get that some people might be irritated by these things that are rough around the edges. And almost everything except sound quality is rough around the edges. There is a lot of features here, a lot of useful features, including EQ, including great choice of inputs and outputs. And uh, I compared it sonically to these DG1, DG1 signature and Lime Tree Bridge. But if you actually think about connectivity, all of these are usually dedicated to one connection only. Like Digi1 series is coaxial, Line 3 bridge is coaxial, Allo USB signature is USB only. This one has like four or five 
different digital outputs. It has an LCD, a remote, but it doesn't have a native app that you can install on your phone. You have to rely on some sort of third-party app. So user experience and operating system could definitely use one decent upgrade. But I don't know if anything like that will ever be released. I cannot rely on that. I can only ten tell you what's the situation right now. And right now the situation is that the unit is finicky. It's loaded with functions and features. It's loaded with different connections. It has great sound quality at a more than a reasonable price, but it's very finicky. And if you're a type of user that would be annoyed by that, I'm not sure that I can recommend it. But on the other hand, if you're more like me, if you're always seeking for the highest possible fidelity at the lowest possible price, this one is a keeper. And that's basically it. It's a great sounding unit, but some opportunities were definitely missed. And I hope that SMSL and Shenzhen Audio that actually cooperated with SMSL to create this unit, I hope they will update this firmware because there is an option to do it. I hope they can fix and improve the user experience. But until they do, it's up to you to decide what's more important to you. For me personally, as I mentioned, I'm a sound first type of guy and I have no problem putting up with few works and few unpolished things here and there when it sounds as good as SD9 does. And with that, it's time to end this review. Thank you all for watching. If you like this video, then click that button, share it with your friends, etc., etc. See you next time. Mm -hmm.